Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thanks to my friends at FINA for the opportunity to come and talk about something which I find a, a fascinating subject. I've got 25 minutes. In 25 minutes, I'm going to scratch the surface of the issues relating to nutrition and performance in the aquatic sports. Only just scratch the surface, but maybe I can do enough to convince you that nutrition is something that every athlete, every coach, every team doctor, every member of the support staff has to take very seriously. And much of what I'll say is based on a conference that took place almost exactly three years ago in another London in a small country on the northwest corner of Europe, where FINA held an experts group meeting, invited a small panel of experts and spent three days discussing issues of nutrition and specifically how nutrition influences all the aquatic sports. And that conference was the basis of the booklet which you have in your conference bag on nutrition for the aquatic sports. So I hope you'll have an opportunity to look at that booklet and to follow up too on the more detailed publications that emanated from that conference. I'm doing something wrong here. If we think about nutrition, uh, it's always tempting for everyone who talks about their own pet subject to say it's the most important thing in the world. But if I think seriously about the factors that make a great athlete in any sport, these are the ones that I come up with. And I've tried to rank them by putting an appropriate font size along them. And clearly, at least as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing is talent. Alan might say the most important thing is doping, but I prefer to think that we have some athletes who are clean. They're talented, but they're motivated, and they do the training. And they respond to that training, this thing we call trainability, with an improvement in performance in response to that training. And they manage to avoid injury. And if you're on the starting blocks, then all the guys alongside you also are talented and motivated and reasonably injury-free. So now it's the small things that make a difference. Not the big things, it's the small things. And nutrition is one of those small things that makes a difference. And can you see what it says underneath nutrition? It says supplements, and some people can see it, so I probably made it too big. I'll make it smaller for my next talk. And when I think about talking on the subject of nutrition, especially when I'm talking to athletes and coaches, I'm reminded of a conference on football I went to in Norway uh, some years ago, and, and Doug Kaz was the coach of the incredibly successful Norwegian women's football team. And in his presentation, he said normal training gives normal results. And I think every coach and every athlete knows that. If you want to beat the other guys, you have to do something different, whether it's training harder or training smarter or introducing some new things into your training. You have to do something different. So when I talked the next day, I said normal diet gives normal results. It's just the same. If you do what everybody else does, you're not going to beat them. You have to do something smarter. Now, if we think about nutrition for peak performance, I've made a couple of statements here. I said we all eat every day. That's not, and I put that little asterisk in there, that's not an evidence-based statement. That's based on personal observations. Not everyone eats every day. There are some people who skip days. So it's not entirely true, but most of us eat most days. And most days we eat several times. Every time we eat, we make some choices. I'll choose this rather than that. And I watched what David Girard ate at breakfast this morning. Some people make good choices and some people make bad choices. <laughs> and the individual choices we make for a single meal are probably of no consequence. But if we repeat those choices on a daily basis, several times a day, the cumulative effect becomes crucially important. It makes us who we are. And you can choose this as your habitual diet, or you can choose this as your habitual diet. They're very different food choices. When we travel away from home, we go to some very nice buffets and some very nice hotels, we can make choices. We don't always make good choices. So when we think about nutrition, we think about the everyday eating. We think about the training diet for the day in, day out training over the large part of the year. 
And then we think about special strategies round about competition time. And the athlete is usually more concerned with what do I do on race day? What do I do to recover between heats? But perhaps the focus should be much more on the training diet than on the competition diet. And of course, the pattern between training and competition varies across the year and diet must vary accordingly. It's not fixed and immutable, it changes over the year. And it's not as simple as simply talking about nutrition because there are other things involved. And the two key things are to identify each swimmer's nutrition goals. So we talk about carbohydrate, and we talk about protein, we talk about hydration, we talk about vitamin D, and we talk about phytonutrients and all the other things. But people don't eat carbohydrate, they don't eat protein, they don't eat vitamin C, they eat food. There's no point in telling an athlete what they should be eating in terms of nutrition goals. We have to work with them to devise eating strategies that meet those nutrition goals, that give them the nutrients they need. And we can choose many different foods. And we'll see people here from all around the world with very, very different foods in the diet, but all getting rather similar nutrient intakes. So we have to take account of the athlete's personal preferences, which foods they like, which foods they don't like. And we can summarize nutrition quite simply and say, well, we get all the essential nutrients in the foods that we get if we eat a varied diet. And these are the essential nutrients. You'll notice there's one nutrient missing from that list, which is, of course, alcohol. And there's some debate as to whether it's an essential nutrient or not. Most, most would say it's not, but some people would debate that. And we can summarize some of the key issues in nutrition by saying the requirement for some, perhaps most nutrients, is increased by heavy training, but we'll get a lot of nutrients from the diet if we eat a lot of food, which we usually do when we're training hard, and if we consume a variety of foods. But not every athlete has a high, high food intake all the time. The energy demand is low at times in the season. And some athletes have very limited food choices. They do not eat a varied diet. Where are we in terms of what we know and what we believe? Athletes stand still to tell us they need extra protein to build and repair muscle, they need vitamins because industry has convinced them that vitamins give you energy, and they need supplements. Of course, they need supplements, don't they? The scientific research gives some slightly different conclusions. We need to get an appropriate energy intake, sometimes high, sometimes low, perhaps fluctuating over the season. Generally speaking, we need a high carbohydrate intake, but not always. And usually, we need a high fluid intake to replace sweat losses. We need to make sure there's an adequate protein intake. And we need to make sure there's an adequate intake of vitamins and minerals. Not always high intakes, but adequate intakes. And we need to look at the timing of the intake of these nutrients, particularly in relation to training and sleeping and other daily activities. How much energy do we need is a question that athletes often ask. How much should I eat? And some nutritionists will tell you, well, we can figure it out by estimating your resting metabolic rate and adding something for the energy costs of training and the energy cost of daily activities. But those give you a figure that's got an error of plus or minus about 20% if you're good, and maybe plus or minus 50% if you're not very good. It's absolutely worthless because the energy demand fluctuates hugely depending on body mass, training load, growth needs, and on individual characteristics. And sometimes we need to deliberately change it to alter physique. So what can we do? We can use an individual prescription. We can monitor body weight, and we can monitor body fatness. If your body fatness is too high, if you can pinch an inch, as I can, you've eaten too much. You should eat less. If your body fat content is falling, your energy intake is less than your energy expenditure. Highly specific, highly individualized. And we can give advice to the individual on the basis of monitoring. Body composition, of course, can be an issue in many sports, and it can be a particular issue in some of the aquatic disciplines. Coaches become very concerned if they see an athlete gaining weight. But we have to recognize that the ideal physique is individual to each swimmer. We cannot simply say, this is an appropriate body mass or an appropriate body fatness. And we have to consider the consequences of changing physique. 
It may produce better results, but the process of changing it may do more harm than good. Now, if you think about energy when we're active, muscles need energy to do work. All of that energy is funneled through this reaction, which breaks down as adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. That's what happens when muscles do work. All of our metabolism is geared to reversing that reaction, to restoring the ATP level so the muscles can continue to function. And to that end, we have a number of different metabolic pathways. We have the anaerobic processes where we can break down creatine phosphate, transfer a phosphate group, and we can break down carbohydrate to lactate. These have the advantage of occurring at very high rates. They can produce energy fast, but they've got a small capacity. We run out very quickly, i.e. we fatigue quickly. We can use aerobic metabolism using oxygen to break down carbohydrate, fat, and to a small extent protein to produce energy. And carbohydrate breakdown is a key issue. The carbohydrate is stored in the liver and in muscle as glycogen. It's available in relatively small amounts compared to the fat, which can also be used, which is available in much larger amounts. But the oxidation of fat is a slow process and it's costly in terms of the amount of oxygen it requires. If we do low intensity exercise on the left hand side of this picture, the total energy demand, the pink line is quite modest. As we exercise harder, run faster, cycle faster, swim faster, the energy demand increases. At low intensities, we use a lot of fat and a little bit of carbohydrate. When we work hard, we use almost exclusively carbohydrate. And if we're training intensively, we're using mostly carbohydrate. We're not using much fat. So carbohydrate availability is crucial. The demand is high. The store is small. Now, most of the information we have comes from cycling or running because every lab has a cycle ergometer. Most have a treadmill. They use small muscle groups, and they're easy to measure. You can see you can easily take samples of the exercising muscle. This is what happens when you're short of help in the lab. You not only have to be a subject, you have to take your own muscle samples. You then have to jump on the bike and pedal, and you take another muscle sample after exercise, and you can look at the changes in muscle glycogen. Completely painless, completely without <laughs> any effect. And I ask you to think, those of you who work with sports injuries, this is quite a small needle. It's about six millimeters. You stick it in the muscle. You chop out a little bit of muscle. If you injured the muscle, you would say rest, ice, compressive, elevation, all that stuff. What do we say? Jump on the bike, pedal for 15 minutes, <laughs> and then stop and we'll take another sample. And then do another 15 minutes on the bike. And we do this with no ill effects on the muscle, completely without ill effect. Anyway, what it shows us is the muscle glycogen level falls progressively. When it reaches low levels, the individual can't continue doing high intensity exercise. And that's an endurance exercise at constant intensity. That's not like what most people do in training, where there are a lot of sharp, intense bursts. These are some data from high intensity sprinting on the treadmill. Six second sprint, you can use about 16% of your muscle glycogen store. Mostly broken down to lactate, so it can be recycled. But when we do high intensity sprint training, we rely very, very heavily on our carbohydrate stores. It's not something that endurance athlete only has to worry about. So after training, after competition, we have to replace the muscle glycogen. We've got lots of fat in our bodies. We can't convert fat to carbohydrate. We have to eat carbohydrate. So we run into questions like how much carbohydrate should we eat? When should we eat it? What does that mean in terms of the food choices we make? And what about the other nutrients that come with those food choices? From the conference we had a couple of years ago, we have some recommendations. Don't talk about percentages of carbohydrate in the diet, because then the amount you eat depends on the total energy intake as well as the carbohydrate content. Think of carbohydrate as a nutrient with needs in terms of grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight per day. And the needs vary enormously. If we have an easy day, a low intensity day, a skills day, then we maybe only need three grams per kilogram body weight per day. But if we're doing a high volume, high intensity training day, we might need 10, perhaps even 12 grams. That's a lot of carbohydrate to eat in a day. 
We need then to think very much about how nutrition fits into all the other recovery strategies we have to do after exercise. It needs to be periodized depending on the training and it needs to meet the needs of the individual. But the recovery period has to do all the other things the athlete's trying to do and often the focus is on those other things like ice baths, like physio, like warming down, like all the other things that have to be done. So the guidelines say, if your recovery time is short, you're training twice a day, take some carbohydrate as soon as you practically can, and take a series of small snacks during that early recovery phase. If we've got 24 hours to recover, organize your eating to suit your training, your lifestyle, and all the other things. Now switching tack a little bit to think about the purpose of training. Some athletes don't believe it, but the aim of training is to make you perform better in races. It's not an end in itself. It's not about training, it's about getting better in competition. And what training does is it causes changes in the muscle structure and function. We break down some of the proteins we don't want, we make more of the proteins we do want. We know that the adaptation is proportional to the training load, but it's also highly specific to the training stimulus. And this is the sort of experiment we do in the laboratory. A few weeks of strength training, we measure the individual strength every week and the strength goes up, and the training has absolutely no effect on endurance. So the training is highly specific. We've made more actin, we've made more myosin, the proteins involved in muscle strength. We haven't made more of the oxidative enzymes, we haven't increased vascularity, the things the endurance athlete wants. Of course, there are challenges in doing these experiments. There are all sorts of differences between subjects and it's not easy to get volunteers for these experiments. And some people like to do endurance training and some people like to do strength training. But there are some clever scientists around and this experimental model perhaps isn't quite the one you think because these guys took advantage of the fact that subjects had two legs. And one leg trained for endurance on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, and the other leg trained for strength on a Tuesday, a Thursday, and a Saturday. So we have one strength trained leg and one endurance trained leg. And this is what happens. <laughs> you can see the changes in the muscle mass and that means there's more contractile protein. The endurance trained leg doesn't get bigger, but it's got more mitochondria, it's got more oxidative enzymes, it's got more electron transport chains. Highly specific adaptations. That means selective stimulation of protein synthesis and breakdown. Now we've known for 20 years and more that protein synthesis is increased for some time after exercise. <coughs> that is a problem because then we've got less of the free amino acids we need to incorporate into protein. If we feed amino acids or protein soon after exercise, we can stimulate the protein synthesis. But there are some issues relating to the type of protein, the amount of protein, the timing of intake, which weren't known 20 years ago. And the world has moved on a little bit. A couple of years ago at an IOC consensus, we said muscle protein synthesis is maximized if you take about 20 grams of protein in a single feeding. You don't need large amounts of protein. Some people would say perhaps a little bit more, up to 30, but not very large amounts. We know that dairy proteins, especially whey, are more effective than many other types of protein because we know that leucine is particularly important. And we know that timing is important. You should eat soon after training or even during training if it's a very prolonged session. And the reason these things are important is that we're inducing uh, responses in the muscle, we're altering the gene expression, and if we change the amount of fat, the amount of carbohydrate, the amount of protein, we change the expression of those genes. And that's why food choices are important. And that's why we talk about training smarter to get better adaptation from the same amount of training or even reducing the amount of training and hence reducing fatigue, reducing injury, reducing staleness, all the other things. Training smarter, better than training harder. There's a raft of other issues that were discussed at the conference in, in London. We talked about rehydration. I know that Professor Jim Cotter will talk briefly about that. We talked about stress to the damage, muscle damage, inflammation. We talked about the impact of ice baths. We talked about the role of alcohol. 
We talked about supplements, we talked about travel, and most of these things will crop up during the rest of the conference. I won't dwell on them in any depth here. I will briefly mention micronutrients. If we eat a lot of food, we get a lot of micronutrients. So the intake goes up more than the requirement. But we do see some people who have some deficiencies and we need to deal with those. In an ideal world, we take a food first solution. We change the diet to make sure that we can match the requirements. Usually, there's no need for supplementation. But there may be a role for short-term supplementation with iron, perhaps, in an iron-deficient athlete who's showing signs of anemia, with calcium in some situations, and perhaps with vitamin D, which can be challenging if you live in northern latitudes where you don't see the sun for six months, especially if you train indoors. Supplements are a big issue in every sport. We have to recognize that they can enhance performance only if they correct a deficiency. So if you're iron deficient, iron supplementation may help. If you're iron replete, it will not. Or they may have a specific ergogenic effect by changing the limitation to your performance. When we look at the whole range of supplements on the market, there's a handful that may help some people in some situations in terms of performance. And I've listed creatine, caffeine, and bicarbonate, and I put a question mark against nitrate and two question marks against beta alanine. The evidence is not terribly convincing. There's some performance, some evidence for performance-related or health-related effects from a range of other supplements, but it's quite a small group of supplements. We can go on the website and find uh, sellers telling us they can offer us 12,000 different dietary supplements. So out of that 12,000, we maybe have five or 10 that can offer benefits to some swimmers in some situations. I have a couple of pretty simple rules of dietary supplements. If it works, it's probably banned, and if it's not banned, <coughs> then it probably doesn't work. But I had to modify that and introduce a third rule because there is that small group of supplements which may help some people in some situations. So there may be some exceptions and we can't ignore those. They can help performance. We shouldn't pretend they don't. But there are some problems because there are some risks associated with supplement use. There are performance risks and there are health risks. And there is also the risk of a positive doping test. So we need to be careful. We should use supplements only if a benefit is likely. Only use supplements and doses, and I would emphasize the doses that are safe, and we need to understand what is a safe dose. And we should use products that are low risk. And we can identify some products which have greater risks than others. In terms of competition strategies, we can forget about a balanced diet. We're not concerned with a balanced diet on race day. We're concerned with performance. Performance is the sole focus. We can worry about balanced diets on the other 364 days of the year. We need to look at the implications of reducing our energy need when we've tapered and reduced our training load and therefore reduced our dietary intake. When we've got intensive programs with multiple competitions each day for several consecutive days, recovery becomes absolutely crucial, and it has to be practiced in training. And we have to make sure we maintain those glycogen stores, because without it, we can't do high-intensity exercise. And there are a few supplements that may have specific roles in high-intensity competition situations. So in summary, Good food choices support consistent, intensive training while minimizing chronic fatigue, illness, and injury. That's what we can hope for from a well-chosen diet. The diet must be tailored to the individual and should be periodized. We can't simply meet someone once in the pre-season medical and say, this is what you should do for the rest of the year. We need to monitor them. We need to investigate how they're performing. We need to understand the science that underpins the nutrition, but we need practical experience. We need to talk to the coach. We need clinical experience. We need to talk to the physician. But we can say in summary, athletes should consume a varied diet. Restricting your food choices increases the risk of insufficiencies, and we should make sure there's sufficient energy in the diet. We need to be concerned particularly with the macronutrients, carbohydrate, and protein. We need to ensure an adequate intake of micronutrients. 
and we need perhaps to consider using a few supplements in carefully managed situations. And I've said at the bottom, nutrition support in elite sport requires qualified professionals. The days when the physio looked after the team's nutrition, I hope, are in the past. If you have a player with a broken leg, you wouldn't send them to a dietitian. I would hope you wouldn't send a player, an athlete with a broken diet, to a physiotherapist. Thank you very much for your attention. One or two questions? There's room for one or two questions. Thank you uh, a lot for this fantastic uh, presentation. Is there someone in the audience who'd like to put a question for Ron? Do you have a microphone for you? No questions? No. Yes. If you have a player with a diagnosed iron in, in, insufficiency, then yes, you would certainly consider supplementation with iron as a short-term solution while you try to find a dietary solution in the longer term. Uh, no doubt about that. But the routine use of iron supplementation is to be strongly discouraged. A survey in the UK 10 years ago found that we had more athletes with iron toxicity symptoms than we had with iron deficiency anemia. Excess iron is not harmful. It can have serious adverse effects. If you have a high iron intake and you add supplementation to that, you risk some serious health uh, consequences. So the old message which people used to say, I'll take a once a day iron tablet just in case, doesn't exist. We can do the measurements. We can measure ferritin, we can measure hemoglobin, all the other bits and pieces. And we can say, yes, you may benefit from supplementation or no, you certainly wouldn't. So don't take iron just in case, but if you need it, by all means take it. 